uh, join us uh, later. Um, and, and, and we look forward to really getting your views. We will be preparing a report on your views, uh, not only press release, but we'll also employ all the methods to get your voices uh, through social media and others, as well as a final report for the, for the record and for perusal by the concerned government departments. Um, I'll make only four uh, points. One is that debt overload, in my view, is a, is a global phenomenon. It's not just developing countries, but I think developed countries are also getting affected. Of course, the markets are so skewed that developing countries get affected far more than the developed countries. The second point is that the global crisis is deepening, mainly uh, uh, all, already I think before COVID hit, hit us, economic slowdown was visible, but after COVID has come uh, into play, uh, my sense is that we're moving towards a recession and perhaps a depression, uh, which could match uh, uh, the 1920s depression, if not exceeded. So we have to take it seriously. The world trade has, is shrinking. World Trade Organization says that there'll be two to three trillion dollars of financing deficit for developing countries in the next two years. Serious, uh, serious stuff. The third point that I want to make is that it's time for solidarity. And that's where our prime minister's uh, call is relevant. Uh, United Nations Secretary General has already welcomed his call. And the idea is that stakeholders should come together to promote coordinated health and economic response on one level and lay ground for managing debt relief uh, uh, to be provided to the developing countries on the other. Uh, we noticed that some actions have already taken place in that direction. G20 meeting in Riyadh on 15 April uh, committed um, uh, one year debt relief to developing countries for an amount of $500 billion of li immediate liquidity to developing countries for the health sector. Uh, World Economic Forum, uh, the Prime Minister spoke to them in that online session on 20th May and urged the developing, developed countries to share the burden of debt of developing countries. Um, I believe that Prime Minister has also spoken to Paris Club and other uh, financial institutions too. The, the fourth point is that Pakistan is quite uh, adversely affected by what is happening now. We still don't know where it is headed. We are told that we are still um, approaching the peak or perhaps from 1 June to uh, 14 June, we are in the peak. Um, the lockdown has affected the most poor of our, uh, our society. The GDP is shrinking, growth rates have gone down, remittances have gone down, exports have gone down. And, and the uh, Exports, <coughs> well, we'll see the results uh, the later, but it appears that the mar market is shrinking. Uh, uh, tourism, aviation, so many sectors are affected. So, um, and on top of it, the government is required to provide stimulus packages just like the $8 billion uh, that it did. So, uh, um, it's, a, it's a tough challenge. It's a hard nut to crack, um, but we thought it was worthwhile to pick one aspect of it, which is providing debt relief, which, uh, which could uh, salvage the situation to an extent. It is not a panacea, it's not a solution for all uh, ills, but it can certainly help um, uh, at this time. And that's why we, our top title says, time for solidarity. With that, uh, once again, a very warm welcome to the speakers. Back to you, Ajahn. Sir, Dr. Salman Shah sahab has also joined us, sir. All right, very good. Dr. Salman Shah sir, very warm welcome to you. I, uh, let me put on the chat. Uh, sir, you need, uh, yeah, you have unmuted. Sir. Dr. Salman Shah sir, very pleased to have you with us. You are a renowned uh, name um, in the world of finance and economics. So we are very pleased that you are with us. Today. Can you hear us, sir? Thank you very much. The pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yes, Najam, back to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for those welcome remarks, sir. We shall, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we shall now move on to, to uh, our session uh, with our speakers. Uh, may I now request uh, Dr. Usman Chuhan uh, for his remarks. Dr. Usman Chuhan is currently 
Director, Economic Affairs and National Development at the Center for Aerospace and Security Studies. He is an international economist and academic who specializes in the fields of public value theory, parliamentary fiscal scrutiny, and one belt, one road, and cryptocurrencies. He has previously had key affiliation with the World Economic Forum, the World Bank, and National Bank of Canada. With that introduction, I would request Dr. Chohan for his remarks. Dr. Chohan, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, it's always a great privilege to participate in the sessions of ISSI. We have a very esteemed panel. I would just like to provide some humble remarks. I have prepared a presentation. I just request the host to allow screen sharing. Uh, I prepared a presentation specifically for today. Allow, can you please? Allow, sir. Allow, Dr. Chuan, you can share your screen. Thank you, sir. So, the debt paradigm in a COVID-19 context. The purpose here from my part will be to frame it in a larger consideration of the emerging market crisis that I foresee. And there's a larger consensus that will happen. Other speakers will provide better detail and clarity on our specific circumstances within that crisis. So COVID-19 is a health and economic double whammy. There's two things happening at the same time. There's a public health issue and an economic uh, crisis looming simultaneously. The lockdown has pushed many financial uh, participants, including institutions, households, and governments into a tricky spot and the risk of a default increases. And that's because their factories are ceasing production, restaurants have been closed, commodity prices are falling, uh, remittances are choked, unemployment is rampant and so on. Now, one important and useful indicator is that in 2008 and 9, the IMF was still predicting that 70 plus countries would still have positive growth. And in this crisis, it's only nine countries in the world that would have positive growth. So the scope of things is far worse this time around than 2008, 2009. Um, this graph I think is very important because there is a trade-off in the debates. People say no lives are important, the economy is secondary, which is true from an ethical and moral standpoint, but there is a trade-off. And so the longer you uh, keep the lockdowns, the more intense the recession will be, the shorter you have it, the more debts you will see um, if you let people out early, but the recession will start to um, subside. So there is a trade-off that we have to discuss point blank. And where does debt come into that? Well, you see on the, this slide that sectors of the economy all are highly indebted. So corporations which are financial, like banks, but non-financial corporations as well, your large multinationals, governments, and people as households all possess debt. The size is about 300% plus of GDP of the world. Now, developed countries are more indebted, but this belies the increase year on year in debt that has happened over the last two decades. So emerging markets have been very proactive their governments, but even more so their corporations in accumulating uh, debts. So here on this uh, slide, I think it's useful, 1995, 2007, and 2019 are episodes, and we can measure how things have risen. Uh, government debt has doubled, for example, to 70 trillion. That's the second one, so you can see my cursor, it's this one. You can see it shot up to nearly 100% of GDP worth in size, and the same is true for corporations, just the jumps are so enormous between 1995 and today. Um, you see a slight decline in the banking sector between 2007 because of tougher regulations and deleveraging, but overall you see an increase. So what, what's scary about this is that for emerging markets specifically, there is $900 billion in debt that is coming due for them in the shorter term horizon. Uh, this uh, universe is quite large, it includes China, but emerging market debt is, is a very large um, absolute amount. The, the, the graph over here I want to present is about frontier markets. I picked frontier as opposed to emerging markets here because Pakistan used to be categorized as a frontier market and then as it stabilized and grew, it became an emerging market. So you see that the, the rise has been substantial, but the categories of uh, debt are very different. So financial corporates are not particularly large, but government debt has swelled and non-financial corporates, so state-owned enterprises, for example, 
uh, weighted as a share of GDP is very large for frontier markets. And frontier markets are particularly vulnerable in terms of the fragility of their uh, financial systems, as well as the risk of default. So they tend to be rated junk by the credit agencies in terms of B, as opposed to the ABC. They tend to be rated B or below, and there's a much likelier incidence of them going back. <laughs> Why is this scary in the COVID context? Well, the graph here on the left is very important in that instance because in general, emerging markets were receiving flows of funds in billions of dollars. It fluctuated from, uh, you can say, quarter to quarter, but in general, it was positive. Uh, a large part of that was China, but emerging markets excluding China as well. And in the most recent quarter, you see that it has fallen through the floor and it's everybody running for the door to the safety of the dollar. So for all the discussions you may have heard of things like cryptocurrencies or a multipolar world with many currencies and de-dollarization, ultimately people did in a panic state to do the zombie thing and they just went point blank straight for the dollar. And so emerging markets had a large loss of a foreign portfolio investment. And the graph on the right shows just how intense this is because, uh, in comparison to the GFC and two other emerging market uh, mini crises in 2013 and 2015. So within T plus 75 days, so whenever the incidence of that crisis was revealed to the markets and then 75 days out, so two or two and a half months, for COVID-19, the drop has been uh, much, much lower. So the non-portfolio flows are almost minus 100%. So mathematically, that's almost a zero, right? So that's very scary in terms of what has happened in COVID and why this is different and why, therefore, it is important for our prime minister, our government, to articulate the need for debt relief. So this presents a larger context in which the details can be discussed. Now, I'm raising the question of half-hearted relief because... The G20 did, as um, Sir so as Chaudhary pointed out, agree to temporarily freeze about 20 billion of bilateral loan payments to the 76 poorer countries, and it's urged private creditors to do the same. But my question is, why would they do that? Because there is a big holdout risk. So private creditors will say, well, governments are doing it, so why do we need to do it? And how would you compel private power to deal with that? So there is a moral understanding among countries to work together to save the system, but private power doesn't share or articulate those values. So maybe you will have ad hoc standstills and restructurings, but this makes it even more important for the debt relief effort to be subsumed within a larger movement and private power has to be incorporated into that. So if you look at it the, in approvals by institution, the IMF has at least in rhetoric been the most proactive. It's written papers, it's already had talks, made to, uh, press releases, but their commitments are about 67 US dollar billion in um, a approvals for this sort of relief and stimulus. And some of the multilateral um, organizations are following suit, but small. So if you look at that graph, the Inter American Development Bank is 0 0.2 billion, it's tiny. Now, it should be taken in the context of, so as Ash Chaudhry rightly mentioned, that's two to three billion that's required in terms of fiscal relief. Uh, over the immediate period, the, the one to two years, but that the IMF estimates it's 2.5 billion. So where does 67 billion fall within 2.5 trillion, excuse me? It's, it's nothing, it's, it's tiny, and that, that, that is the problem. So they may uh, give you the lovey-dovey rhetoric, but the magnitude is just too small. And to go to private powers context in that, I point to the vultures. So private power, these vulture funds, this is a subcategory of hedge funds and other financial institutions that profit from the distress of sovereign governments who are unable to pay their debts. And what has happened is that particular private companies have become so large as creditors to particular countries that they can basically dictate the structure of any uh, relief or even how the restructuring is to be done at all. So Franklin Templeton, which is a large financial giant based in the United States has so much of the bonds of Ukraine 2015 that it has been able to dictate how things happen and things have not gone well in Ukraine fiscally over the last five years. Uh, Lebanon is perhaps what you would consider the nightmare scenario for Pakistan. So there's people on the streets, there's rioting, they're asking the government to step down and fall. That's Lebanon for you. And Ashmore is the private creditor that owns so much of them that they're willing to uh, decimate the country. And so uh, Israeli tanks are less threatening to Lebanon than Ashmore is. And then finally, Argentina. Argentina has been in almost three decades now, of cri or two decades specifically, of crises since 2001. And creditors have been uh, playing ping pong with that society. 
Fidelity, BlackRock, and T. Rowe Price. So BlackRock uh, manages $2 trillion in assets, and they've become even stronger since COVID happened. And so they own so much of the debt of Argentina that they'll basically dictate what happens to a country of 30 million plus people. And so the vultures, the private power is the aspect of debt that I want to highlight that is not covered by the moratorium and the positive rhetoric. So as Pakistan makes the appeal for debt relief, we have to somehow keep an eye on private power in that. And after that, well, we have to realize that China is now the largest official creditor to the developing world, larger than the Paris Club that we've been talking to, the World Bank, the IMF. And so China needs to then step in and, and understand that that's particularly relevant because they started COVID, not to ascribe blame to their government, but this emerged in Wuhan. And so that uh, positive relationship that Pakistan has fostered with China, a, a brotherhood over the years, has to be part of the discourse where China should be far more lenient in the debt repayment going forward. Um, now, one proposal, in addition to what has been um, proposed by Pakistan and all those meetings are important, but a technical proposal is a central credit facility. So whatever would have been given in uh, interest payments uh, on sovereign debt would then be allocated into a fund pool that could be borrowed against for COVID specific relief. That's the proposal. These are two uh, academics that are uh, leaders in sovereign debt restructuring, Lee Burkheit and Gulati. It's their pro um, proposal. But again, the problem is that Private power is not interested. The vultures seem uninterested. In it. So what is the bigger context in which I want to pose the worry that I have is that ultimately we have many rules. It's a rule-based world order, but there are no rules specifically for one type of crisis, which is a sovereign debt restructuring. There are, there's no international <coughs> system for systematic sovereign restructuring. Why would there be? Because so many private players can make such a killing off of the misery of countries so they don't want this to happen. But in terms of building a truly world-based order, having proper sovereign restructurings that are done in a humane, compassionate, and sustainable manner while help helping out the creditors over the long run so as not to have moral hazard is important. That's one aspect of the world system that I think is uh, empty. Finally, we've been writing at CAS a lot about coronavirus, and so I'd encourage people to visit our website to read about other aspects of the economy as it's being shaped by coronavirus worldwide. So thank you very much. I yield the floor. Thank you, Dr. Swan. Thank you for your remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would now request our next speaker, uh, Mr. Farooq Iqbal Khan, for his remarks. By way of introduction, uh, Mr. Farooq Iqbal Khan is Director General, United Nations, at the Pakistan Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Dr. Farooq Khan, sir, you have the floor, sir. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. I hope you can all hear me. We can hear you. Thank you. Um, I uh, First, I apologize for slight delay in my joining this meeting. I was tied up with another engagement, which took some bit of more time. Um, to start off, uh, I have had Mr. Chohan for his remarks, uh, partly though, and I think uh, they're going in the right direction. Um, the situation that I'm going to lead you into is uh, what led the Prime Minister to launch this initiative and uh, where we are and what do we foresee as the future of uh, how the debt relief and the associated issues are going to play out. Um, primarily, our effort um, were to ensure that this time around, unlike the Jubilee 2000 movement that took place um, back in where the HIPAA countries were associated with the debt relief, uh, our effort was that Pakistan, which is one of the IDA country, one of the 76 countries, and usually falls under a different the criteria than the heavily indebted countries should also be made part of this uh, initiative. So the Prime Minister uh, um, took this initiative. Uh, he launched the call for a global debt relief, um, which he is still pursuing. And he, during that period, the Foreign Minister, the Prime Minister himself reached out to a host of leaders across the globe. They reached out at the foreign minister level, they reached out at the leadership level, and those conversations are actually still going on. Today, the prime minister is speaking with the Italian uh, prime minister shortly. 
and um, the effort was that Pakistan should become and the debt relief in whatever fashion that it should happen should be more holistic. That we succeeded. Uh, Pakistan became part of the 77 countries. The whole IDA countries were included in that effort. And then comes the conditionality, which Dr. Chuhan was highlighting, and perhaps uh, uh, Ambassador Izaz may have also highlighted earlier, that there are certain conditions that are attached to debt. Uh, the, this is not debt relief, but this is a debt suspension initiative, whereby the debt is uh, suspended for a certain period of time until 31st December with an option that uh, um, it could be further extended. Um, but there are conditions in it, uh, for instance, um, that you cannot, uh, certain donors are obviously thinking about uh, that Pakistan or any other country which seeks debt relief will not be able to borrow commercially uh, until uh, that period is over. So there are issues that are still lingering in, in, in addition to those issues uh, that are listed in the uh, G20 um, communique, there are a host of other problems that are emerging. Uh, uh, for instance, there are issues around credit rating. Pakistan is already under uh, being put by Moody's and others to, to review the rating, which will obviously increase Pakistan's risk rating and et cetera. Uh, then there are issues around our currency fluctuation. Uh, while we take more debt, at the same time, the dollar parity vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan changes and our debt increases uh, concomitantly much in a much larger domain than, than we may have gotten. Overall, if you look at Pakistan's situation, you would have noticed that we have given an $8 billion of uh, relief but the hit that we are getting, there is no confirmed number. I don't know if anyone has done any kind of study to that nature. Pakistan is getting on its own. So that reading two four billion from the IMF and that Pakistan has faced because of. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, uh, we, we can hear you, but you keep hanging up. Um, I think there is some instability in the uh, internet connectivity. Cut. But uh, yeah, so what I'm saying is we should understand that Pakistan's, the hit that Pakistan is getting from COVID-19 economically, socially, is much larger than the assistance that Pakistan is getting and the combined with the effort that Pakistan itself is pulling, scampering uh, the resources that we have managed to put forward for uh, the people. And that has pushed the government, as we can see now, to uh, luckily we are not having that terrible situation, but of course we are opening up the economy. Now, fr from the United Nations perspective, uh, or from the larger multilateral perspective, where is this debate heading to? I think there are three strands of this. First is, we had a debt suspension initiative, and it is also becoming clear, uh, apart from uh, certain emergency relief facilities that were offered by the IMF, that debt suspension is falling short of what is needed. Because the extent of damage, like the damage that I said uh, to Pakistan alone, and these are just estimated as of now, we are into this, uh, uh, economic study with the you know, UN and, uh, and the World Bank and others to have a more refined sense of what we have, uh, the kind of hit we will have. But overall, the relief efforts fall short of what countries are need needing. Now you have seen uh, Hong Tart calling for a Marshall Plan. You have seen IMF uh, MD herself talking for 2.5 trillion that is needed for the developing countries. So the first thing is whether this uh, initiative and these, these are the questions that we should actually have debate on. Should we seek now an extension of the debt suspension initiative, extend it to another few years? It means with the associated conditionalities that are there. The second issue here um, from our perspective, um, can we 
lead this debt suspension towards some kind of a debt relief? None of the countries, particularly the G20 countries, and let alone the private creditors or the World Bank, uh, debt relief is not on the card. But <clears throat> it is also very clear if you read any, if I'm, I'm sure you have read a lot of analysis, it is made clear by the academics and the financial experts that without debt relief, salvaging the global economy from recession or an even worse impending, impending depression will not be possible. So you see, it's a, it's a strangely oxymoronic situation where creditors are willing to go at a certain level, but they, they can't go to the level where right now we are talking about Let's say, even if you talk about IDA, it's 77 in deep trouble. And this is a lot of debt that they have to write off. Then comes the third point. If at all, this debate can veered into towards debt relief, what could it be? What could be those conditions that can guide the international community that some kind of given to the countries. And the our conversation, and then I will lead you to what we have established to do this discussion. Very only way, some form of, and I think it's not going to be a lot, but only some form of debt relief that can be obtained will only happen through sustainability. Development, which means debt for nature swap, which means debt for education swap, which means debt for health swaps of this nature. If Pakistan create a framework in which Pakistan offers to the world that, look, we were already doing this on sustainable development goals and on climate. Not only us, but the whole globe is unable to manage implementation in the time frame of 2030, then there is a space in which these debt relief could be considered. That there is no appetite as of now for relief, but if this debate were to move in this direction, this is the only space you have. Which means Pakistan really have to look up into its own policies and recraft them towards sustainability. It is not going to be an ordinary debt relief. The people are going to not come and then throw money in Pakistan, the exchequer or the, uh, or the finance uh, ministry. It's not going to happen that way. Now the fourth point that I'm going to happen, make to you is, and my final point, I'm sorry I'm taking a bit long, but this is a very important debate for Pakistan right now and we should understand the questions. Uh, the fourth is, what did we do? You, you see, there is, and I'm, I'm slightly veering into the politics and economics on both sides, just to make my point clear. You see China coming under serious um, international pressure because the, the, the only conversation that is happening across the globe, and it is very interesting, is to make China comply to the rules that have been set by the Western world. They want the Chinese to actually take the brunt and not only the now, in this scenario, when you have a political debate going on, the rivalry emerging between US and China, and the and I won't say I won't veer into saying it's a cold war. What did we do? Our challenge was again: how do we keep this balancing act? So we launched in New York, and uh, uh, thus far we and successful to create a group of informal friends in which we invited 20 countries, uh, 20 
20 to 25 countries alongside private banks, multilateral development banks, the Secretary General of the UN's office, United Nations Department. And we invited them on a platform saying that, look, we, are, we don't have any preconceived notion. We are not talking about the Secretary General's proposal or a Marshall Plan or this. What we are talking about is that there is a global situation which requires some understanding which requires participation from all of us to come up to certain conclusions. Without any preconceived outcome, we want you to have this conversation, have this conversation with us, with the Chinese, with the Americans inside. There is no platform apart from G20 on which China and US sit. We are lucky enough that we have managed to bring them together on this informal platform as well. Its first meeting took place about three weeks ago, which was a preliminary conversation. Uh, we are, again, like I said, we are wearing this fundamentals that needs to be addressed. Can there be debt relief? And what could be those conditions? Actuation. But you give me $1.24 billion, third day, because of the credit risk you have enhanced on me, those $1.24 billion are wiped out. So all these questions needs to be addressed before any issues pertaining to debt relief can be taken. It's a very difficult conversation, uh, gentlemen. I, I think I should um, congratulate ISSI for holding this conversation because uh, most people don't, most people are reading it outside, but it's important to see the nitty gritties, <clears throat> what we are dealing with and how we need to take it forward. There are real issues at stake here. Pakistan, mm -hmm. indeed, uh, the economy is taking a serious hit. And there are larger questions associated. And here I will finish. Uh, we must understand whether uh, keeping the borders closed is the solution, whether uh, uh, putting globalization under question is the, is the solution. We need to have a clarity within our academia, within the policy makers, that a global crisis of this nature cannot be handled by erecting more walls, suspending trade, making trade impossible, dialing back on globalization. In fact, those are the things which will bring the people back. What the Prime Minister said, the other day, there are 6.5 billion people who are scampering for resources, where are there are 1.5 billion people who've gotten 1.7 trillion of stimulus. Unless you don't bring those 6.5 billion people back into the global economy, we will continue to face this recession. I'll end here. I'm sorry for a very long uh, speech that I've given, but happy to answer any question and listen to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Farooq Sahib. Thank you for educating us on the difference between debt suspension and debt relief. And of course, the finer points uh, associated with debt relief itself. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, I would now not request our next speaker uh, in the program, Dr. Abid Kayum Suleri, uh, for his remarks. Uh, introduced by way of introduction, Dr. Suleri has been, is, uh, is heading Sustainable Development Policy Institute since 2007. He is a member of different policy making forums and advisory boards, including Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council, Pakistan Climate Change Council, National Advisory Committee of Planning Commission of Pakistan, and Trade Policy Advisory Committee, among many others. He publishes regularly in academic journals and also contributes his policy analysis on sustainable development issues, both in print and electronic media. Dr. Suleri, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Chauhan and uh, uh, Farooq Iqbal sir, for uh, setting the scene. Uh, I think uh, policy choices there. Uh, debt relief uh, or debt re rescheduling, if we can uh, uh, say it properly. 
है सो दिस इज अगेन अ वेरी डिफिकल्ट पॉलिसी चॉइस एंड ऑब्वियसली देयर वुड बी नो क्लियर विनर्स इन इट नाउ लुकिंग एट पाकिस्तान्स कॉन्टेक्स्ट इफ यू गो थ्रू द टू वीडियोस व्हिच आर पोस्टेड ऑन स्टेट बैंक ऑफ पाकिस्तान वेबसाइट येस्टरडे वी आर टॉकिंग ऑफ 40% पीपल इन पाकिस्तान लिविंग बिलो मल्टी पॉवर्टी इंडेक्स थ्रेशोल्ड Uh, we are also uh, talking of uh, uh, a negative uh, uh, 0.38% gdp growth uh, in which agriculture was the only savior and we are on also uh, mindful of the fact that uh, debt agriculture would also uh, get affected if we couldn't control uh, the locust uh, plague uh, that has uh, uh, not only uh, invaded uh, pakistan but also iran and india and this year uh, after 27 uh, years Uh, Pakistan has been affected uh, that badly uh, from the uh, locust. Uh, an estimate is that around uh, 500 to 600 billion rupees uh, uh, versus uh, uh, rural economy uh, would be directly impacted if we couldn't uh, uh, control it. And now we are also talking of uh, the situation where uh, uh, lockdown it has uh, uh, shut down many businesses, uh, which has imposed uh, joblessness uh, and uh, layoffs. Uh, and of course, SMEs and SDPI we uh, worked. Uh, Uh, intensively around SMEs, and our estimation is that uh, around 1 million SMEs they may not survive uh, uh, this uh, COVID-19 uh, because of their informal uh, nature and uh, uh, because of uh, the non-documented economy, whereby it would be difficult to provide them any sort of uh, fiscal uh, stimulus. Uh, the same is uh, the story of our uh, exports, uh, the growth of economic activity, uh, the food insecurity, which. Uh, not only due to locust but also if uh, the food supply chain if they get uh, affected uh, either uh, due to uh, this uh, spread of pandemic in the rural areas after eat where people uh, who had gone to their native areas uh, for eat if they have uh, brought any of uh, those uh, uh, virus with them uh, we foresee that uh, kharif crop uh, the crops which are sown in uh, summer uh, those would get affected very uh, badly and uh, that may also uh, create uh, food insecurity now grapple with this situation uh, uh, of course uh, there are two choices one choice as uh, uh, forex have very rightly mentioned uh, we need to take care of our uh, uh, credit rating and uh, we need to uh, remain a responsible uh, state uh, but also we have to uh, follow the suit and the suit is that uh, there is this expansionary fiscal uh, policy uh, everywhere uh, around us and uh, there is this uh, populous uh, demand as well as the need of uh, uh, the hour uh, that uh, we minimize disruption to liquidity uh, we ensure uh, the solvency of uh, sectors businesses and household which are most affected uh, by this uh, crisis now uh, how would it uh, happen when uh, already the gdp is contracting uh, our sources of income those are uh, getting affected and not only uh, the exports are uh, getting affected but uh, we are also foreseeing that uh, remittances would also get affected due to oil price crisis so while on one hand we are uh, getting uh, some benefit of uh, low uh, petroleum prices uh, globally uh, the flip side of it uh, that uh, there would be massive layoffs in uh, gulf countries and that would uh, uh, directly affect our uh, remittances that we would be uh, receiving now with uh, this uh, limited fiscal uh, space Uh, we also need to uh, be mindful of uh, the imf uh, uh, target the extended fund facility program under which uh, the next budget is being prepared uh, of course if uh, we have to uh, take care of uh, some of uh, the uh, commitments uh, with the imf and i'm sure uh, imf uh, uh, they would be mindful of the fact uh, they would be ignoring our uh, non policy fiscal slippage non policy fiscal slippage means Uh, any of the expenditures that we made on covid response but they would not uh, ignore the policy fiscal slippage and the two policy fiscal slippage uh, on which imf as well as any of the uh, our lender uh, even if they reschedule our uh, debt uh, they would be uh, quite uh, uh, mindful of uh, one is energy surplus debt and second is uh, loss making public sector enterprises so uh, we have uh, got uh, the indications uh, from imf as well as from multilateral as well as from g20 that uh, any of uh, the relief that we will be uh, getting 
uh, that is purely for uh, COVID response. And of course, we will not be able to take care of uh, the two uh, uh, loopholes and the two uh, uh, big uh, uh, pilferage uh, holes that we have uh, uh, within our resource uh, bucket. Now, uh, the uh, one of the estimation is that uh, Pakistan would require around $15 billion uh, from uh, in the next fiscal uh, year uh, to take care of our uh, uh, needs. In the absence of uh, uh, exports and remittances, uh, the shortfall that would be uh, having uh, from FPR revenue, so it is at least $15 billion, which is uh, required. Now, looking at uh, some of the revenue which is uh, coming, uh, we have already got $1.38 billion from IMF as a rapid finance instrument. Uh, uh, we have also got $240 million from World Bank groups. Uh, World Bank group is all, also uh, contemplating on giving uh, another $2 billion as a new financing facility. ADB has given us half a billion uh, dollar. Uh, they are also giving us around uh, uh, $305 million uh, as emergency assistance. Uh, and uh, similarly, uh, some small amounts from uh, uh, bilaterals. But uh, all of these uh, amounts, when we uh, look at uh, uh, our uh, public debt profile, uh, it is uh, 34.1 trillion at the end of uh, March 2020. Uh, that was up 7.4% uh, from uh, uh, 31.7 trillion rupees uh, in June and 2019. Uh, more specifically, uh, in uh, uh, the year uh, 2020, calendar year 2020, uh, Pakistan uh, owed uh, uh, 20.7 billion uh, dollars to 11 member of the G20 nation, uh, and we have to make a 1.8 billion dollar payment by uh, December uh, 2020. Out of uh, that 1.8 billion dollar, uh, there is of course interest payment as well as uh, the uh, uh, principal uh, uh, payment as well, and. Uh, well, now, looking back at our uh, kitty, our uh, resources which are available to us, uh, the challenge that Pakistan is facing both in terms of shrinking uh, GDP growth as well as uh, the challenge to agriculture in the form of uh, uh, locust and uh, the stimulus package that uh, it has to give either through a SAS program or to, through uh, various uh, uh, other programs. And also a major determinant of uh, uh, whether going for lockdown or whether keep on uh, uh, running at, as business as usual when we have now around 3,000 uh, uh, confirmed cases uh, on an average per day. So on one every uh, five uh, person which are tested uh, is now uh, uh, corona positive and uh, a death rate of around 60 to 70 uh, persons uh, per day. So uh, the policy choice that Pakistan has to uh, made uh, is to uh, somehow uh, go for uh, debt rescheduling. I know that Pakistan uh, will not qualify for uh, uh, debt uh, alleviation. Uh, uh, I don't see that uh, this debt write-off will be uh, an option for Pakistan. The lenders, they will not uh, include us in it, even uh, if uh, the LDCs are the highly indebted uh, uh, poor nation, if they uh, got it, uh, qualified for it. Uh, Pakistan, uh, fortunately, uh, luckily, will not be uh, among them. Uh, we are uh, uh, slightly uh, above uh, uh, those uh, nations. So maximum, uh, it can be a debt rescheduling uh, by uh, December 2020, and now we have to see uh, whether we can uh, uh, take it further, uh, whether uh, we can uh, get uh, uh, it uh, by uh, 12 months or 18 months. Now, uh, to, towards end, if I look at uh, the policy uh, uh, recommendation, uh, one thing that is uh, uh, we have to uh, decide very clearly that uh, whatever uh, relief we uh, get, uh, we have to spend it on the health sector and to ensure that systems are in place uh, for food security of masses uh, during the crisis. Uh, this is also uh, an important opportunity for us uh, to experiment uh, uh, minimum universal social protection, at least in Balochistan, uh, where uh, we can uh, ensure that uh, each and every one uh, of, the, of a resident in Balochistan, uh, they are protected uh, for health expenditure and they are protected uh, for uh, the unemployment. Uh, in the phase of uh, emergency, it can be, uh, uh, the government can take the brunt of it, but in normal circumstances, it can be uh, contributory. But Pakistan need to now gradually move towards this uh, minimum uh, universal social protection system. Uh, and uh, uh, the tax relief uh, to SMEs, uh, that would be uh, another uh, major uh, uh, arena where uh, 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 this uh, funds would be uh, spent. 
Now, Pakistan would also need to attract the non-debt creating capital inflows from uh, abroad. And uh, for that, we have to think out of box. We have already uh, uh, very uh, successfully generated uh, 200 billion rupees through Islamic uh, Sukuk for power uh, uh, companies, IPPs. And we have to experiment uh, similar other uh, ways uh, for attracting non-debt creating capital inflows. Uh, we also uh, need to uh, uh, join hands with LDCs and emerging market economies for a medium term debt relief uh, that is until uh, 2023 or 2024 uh, while talks are underway no decision uh, has been made on it uh, and we are, uh, have to be uh, mindful that uh, any of the relief we will be getting uh, we will have to keep on uh, abiding by uh, the conditionalities of uh, FATF uh, and conditionalities of uh, 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 especially uh, uh, in part of uh, uh, the documentation of uh, economy uh, and similarly the compliance with the uh, conventions already outlined under Pakistan's access to GSP plus uh, status uh, and a more liberal environment uh, for uh, uh, the businesses uh, to uh, flourish. Now, Economic Affairs VN and uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I know that they, they would already be uh, doing their homework on uh, how uh, to avail this uh, debt uh, rescheduling uh, without compromising the conditionalities, which of course would be extremely important, uh, the FATF, the GSP plus, uh, and uh, many others, if we avail any uh, debt rescheduling. I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Soleri. Thank you for your very nice. pertinent remarks. Uh, our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is Mr. Hamayu Akhtar Khan. Mr. Uh, Hamayu, uh, Hamayun's career spans the area of politics, entrepreneurship, philanthropy, and actuarial profession. He is a strong advocate of policies to empower the working middle class. From 1997 to 1999, Mr. Khan was State Minister for Investment and Chairman Board of Investment. From 2002 to 2007, Mr. Khan was Pakistan's Federal Commerce Minister. In 1997, the investment policy that he initiated is still considered among the best reform initiatives in the developing world. It opened Pakistan's, uh, Pakistan to foreign in investment, resulting in billions of dollars of foreign direct investment. Mr. Hamayu Khan is presently chairman and and CEO Board of Institute for Policy Reforms. With that introduction, I hand the floor over to Mr. Hamayu Akhtar Khan. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you. I wish to thank the Institute of Strategic Studies for organizing this event and for inviting me. And my greetings to the other speakers and to all the participants. There are uh, credible voices on the international stage calling for debt relief as well as more concessional funding for low-income economies affected by the pandemic. They include the IMF, the World Bank, the G20, and some member countries of the G7. Our Prime Minister has had the good prudence and anticipation to be the first among world leaders to call for debt relief and propose a global debt initiative. To analyze the current economic challenges and opportunities for Pakistan during COVID-19, we must understand the underlying tension that is inherent in dealing with the crisis. Addressing the health crisis weakens the economy. While the revival of the economy affects the health of our citizens. For a country with a weak health system, the most important tool to protect the lives of the people is a strict lockdown, allowing economic activity only for the most essential services and supplies. Of course, that brings economic activity to a halt and requires large amounts of resources for welfare and support. It also needs a delivery system to provide basic goods and services to the vulnerable. On the other hand, letting the economy function as is carries the threat of a worsening 
health emergency. Today, Pakistan's economy has uh, two old challenges. The first is its enduring problems. The economy was already in slowdown, even before the crisis came. Commodity producing sectors like agriculture and industry were already sluggish. In fact, for months, large scale manufacturing was in decline. We faced other problems, including high inflation, especially of food and utilities, further rise in public debt levels, a sharp decline in rupee value, and low investment as it was hampered by economic slowdown and a tight monetary policy. Under an IMF program, government brought a degree of economic stability. The current account narrowed. There was also a reduction in the fiscal deficit. Yet, the GDP growth was low, and public debt, including external debt, continued to rise. Second, our already significant economic troubles have multiplied by the challenge of the lockdown. Government and international organizations estimate a fall in GDP of 1.5% for fiscal 20. The finance advisor says that budget deficit may reach 9% this fiscal. For years, the economy's critical issue has been our high reliance on external debt and the resources needed to service it. The continuous escalation of public debt, especially external debt, is a long and endemic problem of our economy. And a worrying feature of our external debt, which is a recent phenomenon, is an increase in borrowing cost, as well as reduction of maturity period. I'll give you some figures. Share of concessional finance from IFIs and Paris Club bilateral donors fell from 87% in 2013 to 64% in 2018. And it stood at 61% in December 2019. This has added to the burden of interest payment in foreign exchange and makes the economy more vulnerable to changes in the external economic climate. Now, let us take a look at what is happening globally and what is the probability of any significant debt forg forgiveness and rescheduling. The IMF has said that it may place an extra amount of $1 trillion to meet emergent expenses of economies in need. The World Bank and the ADB are also similarly committed. The IMF has also said that the world GDP would fall by 3% in calendar year 2020. The leading economies of the US and Europe would suffer considerably. The GDPs in calendar year 2020 are expected to fall by 6% and 7.5% respectively. And bear in mind, these are the two main trading partners of Pakistan. World trade could fall by as much as 30%, and about $100 billion may already have left the emerging economies to safer places. The IMF uh, says that world recovery will be slow and prolonged, and that the economic effect of the pandemic will be felt well through 2021. IMF also estimates that so far countries world over have deployed 9 trillion US dollars to help people and firms get through the crisis, both in direct budgetary spending and in loans, equity, and guarantees. About 90% of this 9 trillion dollars, 90%, has been in advanced economies or G20 emerging economies. This has put a squeeze 
on liquidity globally. And a major world recession is in the making, which is greater than the 2008 financial crisis, definitely, and may well be worse than the Great Depression of 1929. The major economies had been playing a risky game for some years with very high public and private debt, especially private. World nominal GDP is about $83 trillion. World debt, public and private, has grown to $188 trillion, which is a whopping 225% of the world GDP. USA has a debt to GDP ratio of 265%. China, 258%. On an average, private debt of advanced economies was 150% of the GDP. They cannot afford a prolonged recession because the risk is too high. The advanced economies that are also donor countries have very high liquidity needs. Now, with respect to Pakistan, uh, for any kind of debt relief to have a lasting effect, a robust plan for economic growth and development must accompany it. The goal of the plan should be capital accumulation to enhance the economy's productive capacity. That is, increase in the stock of plant and machinery, critical infrastructure, and quality of human capital. This enables structural transformation in the economy that increases the size of the manufacturing sector and its move up the value chain. The resultant increase in exports can pave the way to sustained long-term growth of an economy. Growth in exports also reduces external dependence and vulnerability. I see two conflicting developments in the world taking place at the same time. One development that hinders the chance of a major multilateral debt relief initiative and one that supports it. First, as stated earlier, most major economies have own huge liquidity needs to meet. You should keep that in mind. Also, the environment for multilateral action is fragile because the United States is dismantling the structure for multilateral cooperation that was put in place during the last 75 years. The USA now has a transactional approach to all issues. While the IFIs have increased their lending, they're unlikely to give to agree to substantial deferment or forgiveness of debt on their own without the help of the United States, the European Union, and Japan. On the other hand, there are risks of default. There is an over-leveraged world, and it is at great risk of long-term economic turmoil. If that were to happen, it is equally in the interest of the developed economies to avoid major turbulence in the world markets from countries defaulting on loans, as has happened to Argentina already. Such a development may deepen the economic troubles of advanced economies, prolonging world recession. Yet no multilateral effort would succeed without leadership from the United States. And at present, that seems to be on hold. Therefore, my suggestion is that Pakistan may wish to review if it prefers to be part of a multilateral effort, which may take years, or independently approach important capitals directly. Pakistan is an important US ally and also of China. A high stock of debt means that servicing the debt will take away resources from essential spending needs of the economy. It may entirely put on hold the economy's present and medium-term growth prospects. 
It is creditable that Pakistan has earned debt relief of over a billion dollars in order to revive the economy from the deleterious effect of the virus. We will need more. Perhaps with the help of USA and China, Pakistan may find additional fiscal space. However, Pakistan must have a growth plan in place to ensure that the money is spent on building productive capacity of the economy for future growth. That is the only way to emerge out of the continued dependence on others. And that is the only way we will place ourselves in a position to repay the debt, the further debt that we'll be accumulating. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Hamani Saab. Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Dr. Muhammad Iftakharul Hasnan. Dr. Hasnan is head of the Department of Economics at Comsat University. Dr. Hasnan holds a postdoc from University of Glasgow, United Kingdom. He has 30 publications to his credit. He is also working on projects funded by South Asian Network for Development and Environmental Economics, as well as for Higher Education Commission of Pakistan. Dr. Rasnan, so you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for providing me the opportunity to listen esteemed speaker and share my views on this debt relief issue. I think the panel has completely analyzed all aspects of this debt relief. And what I can guess from here that the most focus is on the short run scenario. It looks like that the COVID-19 is not going away very soon. As many uh, analysts, they perceive and there has been debate that this will prolong, uh, this will remain with the society over a long term. So we need to have long-term solutions to overcome this scenario. So every, everyone knows that this, is, this has impacted the humanity in a multi-dimensional ways. And it, is, uh, it will continue to further hit the economies and the humanity over the very long term. First of all, we would like to have that what are the uh, problems that are currently faced by Pakistan. First is that how to adjust new normal. It is for sure that the humanity will recover from this COVID-19 problem, but the normality will be the new normal. What the mean the new normal that the things will completely change over time, the production scenario will change, the supply chains will change, foreign policy will become different, the relationship between the countries and trade and many other scenarios will be totally different. So we need to have to be prepared for the new scenario and it requires our long-term strategy. The other is that how we can navigate the unsettled world. Everyone knows that there is the problem in each and every corner of the world. Not a single country is free from this pandemic and it, uh, it is now moving from one part to another and dam making damage. And fortunately, by now, we are at the safe side, relatively on the safe side. Now, what the immediate the government is looking for through debt relief, that how to get a breathing space. Now, the, the, there is a matter of time that if government or the country get relief for some times, so say for one year or less than one year, then there will be the possibility that the policies can make the economy on the track and further damage is controlled. The next problem we are facing is that the one of many of the testing speaker highlighted that the employment scenario. I think this is time for the government to think about is the long quiz accuse at the Gulf airports is a signal for the government that be prepared, for, be prepared for the massive unemployment. And this is not only a massive employment problem, this is a socio-economic problem that first of all, there is going uh, our remittances that are the very critical in determining the 
value of the dollars they are going to be squeezed over time so government need need right now to take measures that they can incorporate these unemployment people unemployed people into the uh, routine business now the government is facing the trade offs what is the trade off lives and the uh, economy definitely there needs to be some balance and the government is trying hard to overcome this problem so let's see still there is uncertainty that how the things will unfold over a uh, future but still the government needs to implement the sops at least the government has eased the lockdown the, if the uh, sops are followed i think that its impact can slow down and the government will take some time to overcome this problems if unfortunately over the few last few days we can see that the rate of this uh, infection has increased but government can control it even without the strict lockdown it is my personal view not necessarily true now the exports as remittances ex earning from the exports is very critical for pakistan because dollar is already you can say you can see that is very vulnerable volatile so the government have to make policies that they focus on the exports that are need of the new world they, they there is not need for the traditional exports as the many uh, as we were talking about the previously now we have to know that what could be the possibilities for the exports in future it is for sure that these will not be the previous exports because the trade between the countries will take enough time to reach the previous level and for 100% trade mobility i can i may say with res, uh, reservation guess that it may take 5 years and even more and the next is that how the these can be achieved now the most relevant thing at this is the government have try to get relief and for sure it is going to get relief for some time up to december if we see the facts and figure as uh, ex uh, explained by the our renowned speaker in this discussion we can see that this is a very temporary and very tiny relief for the government the government will have to create the resources from inner side and it is very difficult because the economy is already reeling at a very low point so the government at this time it has to resort towards the fiscal policy as one of the objective of this webinar is that how the fiscal policy can do this fiscal policy the government go for the expansionary fiscal policy the budget is on the way the government should reduce the taxes and make massive spending in different fields the most important field could be the health sector because we have seen that we are going to be exposed if this uh, 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 pandemic rate continues to grow over time so the government needs to fix the areas where it can spend and it can provide the demand for so that the business becomes routine over time now first uh, at the end i would like to say that the government have to scale up and strengthen strengthen social security network particularly government should focus on free health care for all it is very easy to say that providing health care to each member of the society but ultimately the government should start working on it and it should plan for 5 years or 10 years the target that at least it provides the opportunity or the Uh, health care facility to all the people the next government the government has to now re uh, relocate the labor force many labor, um, people are coming from the gulf countries and they are joining already unemployed pools the government should focus on the agriculture sector you can see that in this scenario sops can be followed in the agriculture sector because there the people work not in Uh, in a very close atmosphere they can work from one to another and in this situation that that was the crop wheat crop season many people got uh, employment though, uh, though it was very tiny share but ultimately it showed that the agriculture has still very importance and the government can invest in this sector to provide the uh, the uh, to, uh, to overcome the risk 
as mentioned by the speaker that the locust is a, a big threat the food security is the big threat the government needs to make changes arrangements and once again i would like to say that these are not the traditional changes these are out of the park solutions because now the new normal or the new scenario after the covid 19 will be totally different expansion fiscal policy is the solution i have explained it instead of time bound suspension of the debt till december the the lenders should think about it that if they can give more breathing space to the developing nations who are highly uh, highly hit by this pandemic we have seen very good efforts from the federating units uh, to respond to this covid 19s and uh, and the economy but still the focus is that the more coordinated efforts are required uh, between the federating units so that this problem could be overcome as early as possible investing in poor parts we can see that uh, still this uh, uh, infection disease is mostly reported in the big cities and there is the some of the facilities that the people are uh, going through this but if unfortunately it goes into the rural areas it will be very difficult for the the people are facing it very difficult to follow the sops and lastly i would like to say that this debt relief is a very good effort on the part of our prime minister he was the first vice to uh, announce that this could be the possibility and it will give some relief to the uh, people uh, developing countries i will uh, not go to into the facts and figures that how much trillion but it is only uh, the government should believe it that it is a very short term solution and immediately the government should take long term actions so that the damage could be the minimized economy can be put on uh, back on the track and all the socio economic problems are uh, handled to the maximum possible level with it thank you very much thank you so much dr hasnan thank you for those remarks ladies and gentlemen our keynote speaker for today is dr salman shah dr salman shah is former advisor on finance to prime minister and was minister of finance government of pakistan in 2004 2000 to 2008 a period of extensive economic reform and changes his tenure was significant for the development of the private sector large fdi flows into the country and a successful return to international capital markets with the issuance of global depository receipts uh, euro bonds and islamic sukuk bonds presently he is serving as advisor on economic affairs and planning to the chief minister punjab dr salman shah sir so you have the floor <clears throat> thank you very much uh, first of all i must thank the institute of strategic studies for arranging this webinar which is most timely and most useful and i have learned a lot from the very learned speakers whom you were able to gather for this important uh, uh, topic uh, and i must congratulate your chairman azar sahab for bringing in uh, this kind of uh, input on this topic which i think is staring pakistan in the face uh, what we have to understand is that <clears throat> the pandemic has created the economic situation which pakistan and maybe the rest of the world has not faced in a very long time uh for pakistan over the last uh, 70 years uh, we haven't seen this kind of disruption uh, and even though we have been the most uh, imf country in the world with so many imf programs uh, now everything seems to have been turned upside down uh, number one there is a meltdown of economic activity going all over the world starting with disruption of global trade and disruption of supply chains and value chains both domestically and globally and in pakistan uh the issues which we were 
tackling of uh, the twin deficits and the balance of payment prices uh, have suddenly been changed, as most of the uh, speakers have recognized, into issues of a depression. How, uh, how can we avoid our economy to go into a depression? I'm saying it is not only a recession, uh, we are heading into a depression uh, where the entire production system of the country has been disrupted. It's not a demand-driven disruption. It is a supply-driven uh, disruption, which has, uh, we haven't seen anything like this in the last 70 years. So if we look at this disruption, the urban economy uh, is definitely uh, paralyzed. Uh, the services sector in Pakistan is almost 60% of our GDP. And in the services sector, we see all the wholesale markets, the retail markets, and uh, almost every aspect of services is affected. Almost 30 million uh, people are probably already lost their jobs, who are not having any income, and their income compression is going to lead to a cycle of a, a downward cycle, because as your uh, production shrank, your income was compressed, then your com consumption will be com uh, compressed. And as your consumption goes down, uh, your investment also goes down, uh, your production will go down further. So this is something which we have to arrest very, very quickly. So the paradigm shift has to be, how do you protect the economic cycle? How do you protect the supply chains? How do you pr protect the employment uh, uh, so that the economy can at least uh, stop uh, going into a depression and perhaps stabilize? So stabilize uh, today, stabilization is a totally different uh, concept from yesterday. Uh, stabilization before was dependent on controlling the twin deficits and uh, the external account and then also to be able to focus on taxes to correct the fiscal deficit and growth was not an issue or was not on the forefront. Uh, but now I think everything is it has been put back and growth has to be the, uh, the, the focus. And in, in terms of growth, first you have to ensure that you don't go into the negative zone and you are able to protect your economy. And secondly, you are able to create more employment opportunities because the regular supply of jobs from the private sector is going to shrink considerably. And that means that the government has to ensure somehow to not only provide social security, uh, for the people who will be displaced. And when you are looking at your budgets now, and I mean, lots of uh, speakers have uh, alluded to it and mentioned it, that we see very huge uh, shortfalls particularly on the remittances side and on your export side, that pressure uh, leads to your revenue uh, generation to go down. And then the relief which you are giving, that means your, your revenue is going to go further down, uh, which means that if the budgets have to be prepared under an IMF framework of uh, fiscal restraint, uh, then unfortunately that would mean that uh, the development budget will have to be sacrificed. So your, uh, maybe even your current budget would have to be frozen. And uh, if uh, we look at the development side, already our throw forward of development projects uh, probably runs into two to three trillion across uh, Pakistan. And in an environment where uh, government has to provide employment opportunities across the districts, uh, you would have to do development work. Infrastructure development would have to be your number one priority.
which means that you have to be able to finance it. Now, Pakistan, that means, <coughs> has not only a health crisis, it has a financial crisis. And this financial crisis, uh, we have, what are the options which we have? Obviously, taxes is not an option because that's an area where you are <coughs> not, uh, you are providing a lot of relief and also uh, you are not in a position to boost your taxes as it further uh, uh, kind of downgrades economic activity. <clears throat> so the option remains that you have to find uh, more debt, more debt from the domestic sector and more debt from global uh, uh, sources. <clears throat> and that's where the problem lies. Domestically, we may be able to uh, raise uh, the debt ceiling, which the National Economic Council puts in place, uh, which has not yet acted on that, but ultimately it will have to act so that your development and infrastructure development has to be able to be uh, put into place. And secondly, <coughs> our financial uh, uh, sector, which Bit more forthcoming in infrastructure finance and as somebody said SMEs 1 million SMEs are going to get out of business and that will be a catastrophe uh, so the financial sector has to play an extraordinary uh, role in all of this. So this then brings me to the issue which is at hand and that is what happens to our debt. <clears throat> if we look at our debt profile we are almost 100% of GDP in debt, but about one third is external debt. But our external debt is also composed of many different kinds of debt, from multilateral debt to bilateral debt, also to commercial debt. <coughs> and all of these different uh, forms of debt would need a different kind of a treatment, but I think it would need a global approach to tackling this. So if the G20 has taken a start and it is a very meager start, uh, just suspending the debt is not really uh, going to be uh, helpful in countering the effects of Corona. But <clears throat> if we can get into the relief side, uh, then the next step would be that what happens uh, bilaterally and how will we manage the commercial side and the private sector debt because the private sector debt is also very, very high. <clears throat> and there we need a coordinated actions backed by national governments uh, to tackle this issue. Now, Pakistan's debt of almost $100 billion has a average repayment period of six to seven years which means that we have a very high risk of default. If we look at, uh, uh, if we cannot refinance this uh, debt as it comes due every year, it would probably start to increase <clears throat> and 15 billion, 10 to 15 billion debt uh, will have to be repaired. The interest payments have to be repaired. So the burden is going to be very huge if the debt window is shut uh, or the international debt window closes and Pakistan cannot uh, restructure its debt because we would need to take this uh, period to at least uh, 15 to 20 years uh, if we have to be able to this debt. So uh, that has to be very, very important. Uh, plus the kinds of <clears throat> uh, funds which are uh, which uh, Dr. Chauhan was talking about, if that kind of fund is established where your uh, debt uh, servicing uh, can be funneled back into co uh, COVID-19 type of activities, that would be very good. And then how do you really deal with the multilateral debt? And that, <clears throat> that historically, uh, is not open for restructuring it. Uh, so the World Bank and the IMF and all the international financial institutions 
uh, will have to come up with ideas of how do you really refinance everything and it continues and uh, we are able to not only uh, stop the hemorrhaging of uh, finances in the developing country but also we are able to enhance it uh, because this is the time uh, when uh, we can really commit to a very uh, very strong reform program in exchange for debt concessions and that uh, the uh, swaps for education, swaps for agriculture, swaps for climate, etc. Uh, those are the kinds of things where we could have uh, very important and uh, good uh, reforms. Uh, people talk about <clears throat> the agriculture sector as being some kind of uh, uh, an escape well for our economy, and but unfortunately, <clears throat> if you look at the agriculture sector, it's highly unproductive. Uh, the productivity in the rural sector is one third of the productivity in the urban sector. And as the urban sector uh, sets uh, is, is under a lot of pressure and uh, it, it slows down the agriculture sector, the major uh, improvement has to be through productivity and a much better supply chain <clears throat> uh, arrangements, uh, which means that from seed to implements to, uh, uh, to, to markets to logistics, everything has to be revamped and redesigned and the markets have to really start to function and uh, you need to do a lot of uh, reforms in, 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 in those chains. Uh, similarly, in, in uh, uh, millions of other supply chains uh, across Pakistan, we are the most unproductive, most uncompetitive uh, in the entire world, and those those have to be uh, changed. So, the on the brighter side, if I look at it, that for the first time uh, in the uh, in Pakistan's history, uh, economists have been forced to look at supply chains and how to manage supply chains. And suddenly, we have found uh, that we badly manage the supply chains. The regulatory environment for supply chains is extremely poor. The input, human input and other financial and uh, technical know-how is very limited. The markets are underdeveloped. So in a way, if we can improve our supply chains, things could work out. But the fly in the ointment is really <clears throat> the debt which Pakistan has. And unless we are able to come up with a good strategy, I think this is a good idea that Pakistan has taken uh, the lead, uh, but I think Pakistan needs to develop some very good proposals for this to uh, uh, happen, and uh, not only on a <clears throat> on a uh, integrated uh, global platforms, but also bilaterally. As somebody mentioned, that maybe uh, we should be uh, talking on a bilateral basis, but I think. <clears throat> we need to talk uh, bilaterally as well as uh, in, on global platforms so that we can get uh, relief. Because one thing is certain that if we don't get this relief, uh, I don't think we can service our debt at this point in time because of the total disruption in everything. Our inflows have been badly disrupted. <clears throat> and so you would need time to adjust and restructure the entire debt and to make the economy better at the same time. So lots of balls in the air which you have to juggle. But I think that this initiative of the Prime Minister is very, very important. And I think that this webinar, if we can, as uh, Ras have said, we are going to put this into a paper of some sorts. And uh, so maybe we can uh, come up with a comprehensive debt strategy. Uh, which can take Pakistan not only to a sustainable uh, economy, but into a growing economy. So I think uh, uh, this is what I had to say, but I think the whole ideas over here were fantastic. And if there are any questions, and maybe we can have a few questions and answers. Uh, 
uh, some very pertinent observations and points have been made and some very useful recommendations as well. We are now open for uh, an interactive discussion session. You are free to raise questions and ask and make your comments. I would request that you identify the speaker that we are open for your questions and comments. I, I believe uh, uh, A. Marshal Ashwak Rai had, had a question or a comment. Uh, Ashwak, sir, uh, please, we are going to unmute you. You can raise your, your comment or your question. Okay. Assalamualaikum. Uh, thank you very much for enlightening us. My question is that uh, after the pandemic, we saw that humanitarian assistance and other uh, claims, they fell apart. It was always in the national interest that the countries were doing whatever they could, and they even put some embargoes on the PPEs, etc. Mm -hmm. Unless there's a logic given to the developed world that if they don't take care of the developing countries, this pandemic will continue to strike back at the developed world. They will not support the developing countries. Do we have uh, any such suggestions? Is this a, a, an open question to the panel or somebody specific? Uh, to the panel. Thank you. Uh, I can uh, add something here, Najam. Uh, uh, I think uh, wonderful ideas uh, have come up and uh, uh, certainly, we would need to uh, make a story out of it for the government to follow. Uh, the last question that Air Marshal asked, uh, I think that's the whole point. The interdependence is the issue that needs to be highlighted. The true that the nations are motivated by their own national interests and are quite selfish, even in humanitarian disasters, because even in wars, there are people out to make money. Um, that's true. But in this case, we have to tell them that when you pick one end of the stick, you automatically pick the other. Uh, and therefore, uh, it says a job that we need to convince. Uh, uh, and therefore, multilateral forums will remain important. Yes, bilateral track is important. But I think multilateral platforms will, will remain important. That's my just two cents there. Thank you, sir. Anybody from the panel uh, would like to take on those those uh, queries? Or if I may jump in. Abhid sir. Abhid sir. Yes, uh, and I think Air Marshal uh, sir has raised a very uh, pertinent and important point. Uh, you see, in the pandemic, and uh, this is uh, also an argument which is uh, uh, being uh, uh, provided uh, uh, domestically. Uh, if all of us who are sitting here, if we take care of our uh, family members, providing them with the best of uh, the sanitizers and everything, and we ignore our domestic service provider right now, what would be the consequence? The consequence, of course, would be that uh, uh, through them, we'll get uh, uh, chances that uh, through them, uh, we get this COVID-19 are quite uh, high. So similarly, uh, this is one of the points that uh, the developed countries, uh, they're quite convinced about it that providing relief or providing uh, uh, that rescheduling right now to developing countries is not uh, an act of gratification. Actually, if we have to take care of pandemic from this world, uh, this needs to be done. Uh, we can't keep our borders closed forever. And the moment we will open up our borders and if there is uh, uh, this pandemic in developing countries or in some of the at least 12 countries, it would automatically hit uh, the developed nations as well. So uh, I think uh, uh, this uh, awareness, awareness is very much there uh, among G20, among Paris Club, and that's why this whole thing is moving on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, may I say something? Please, among you please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, we, we, we got to realize that uh, <clears throat> I mentioned in my remarks that uh, this is a highly leveraged world, uh, and it's <laughs> more leveraged. Uh, with respect to the developing and the emerging uh, economies. So uh, there definitely is a realization that uh, the countries, the developed countries will have to look at 
the not so developed economies uh, very definitely and uh, uh, that is why you have been uh, hearing voices uh, from the G20 and uh, uh, some members of the G7 economies like France and uh, the World Bank President uh, David Malpass has been talking about it. So I, I think the world is uh, uh, very much aware that uh, the, the whole uh, developed as well as developing nations will have to be looked after to come out of this uh, situation. Uh, my only problem is uh, that uh, the multilateral effort uh, would succeed, uh, will not succeed without leadership from the uh, United States. And uh, as I see uh, right now, uh, that is not forthcoming. Uh, uh, I, I, as I mentioned, I see the environment for multilateral action fragile because the United States is actually dismantling the multilateral uh, structure and is very much now uh, focusing on a transactional approach to all issues. And that is why I have suggested that while we continue to focus on the multilateral aspect of what we want, we should also uh, be talking directly uh, to the United States, which uh, as of now is our ally, and of course, uh, China, two very important, two largest economies of the world, uh, uh, to, to seek uh, the relief uh, that uh, Pakistan wants. Uh, so we have to go on a two-track basis, multilateral, uh, which countries are very serious, but the United States uh, has a lackluster response. And therefore, Pakistan should also be focusing, uh, talking directly to the United States bilaterally and to China. Um, can I add one very small comment to this? If, um, this is Farooq. Right. Thank you. I think well, I, I agree with uh, Mr. Akhtar, Amay Akhtar, that um, the U.S. situation is pretty. Um, so they're militating against globalization, they're militating against international agreement, they're militating against the multilateral system. And that being said, that's very correct. Um, but at the same time, I think what I have seen during the past few, um, at least since 12th April when the prime minister launched this, within our own system, there is a sense of skepticism that, oh, we should either get a check immediately or all these efforts means nothing. You know, uh, it seems as if everyone is looking for a very quick breakthrough. It is not possible to have a breakthrough in immediately. This, this, is, this is a long drawn battle. If you want to do this, there are, there are rules militating against you in the international investment arena. There are rules militating against you in the international financial architecture. You want to do this, we have to do this gradually. We have to build multilateral consensus on this alongside all the fissures that are emerging. So this is not an easy battle. And if anyone is expecting that, I continue to hear from the system that, oh, sir, what, what are we getting out of this? This is a very strange comment that you get from uh, people in policy making situations. So I just wanted to make sure that we, 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 we know that multilateral system with, a, with a, all its fault is still working and in order for it to work we all have to devote some more attention and make sure that we get something out of it. Uh, sorry, if I may jump in. Say something. Yes, sir, um, in addition to what Sir Farooq is saying, one thing that I wish to highlight in my presentation was the concern that even if you do persuade the developed countries and you get the multilaterals on your front. At the same time, how would you be able to convince private power to do that? How would you convince Fidelity and all these other major investors to also engage? They have a holdout initiative. They'll say the government is taking the hit so we can still continue to make a profit. And I think the persuasion of private power is actually the deepest problem for emerging markets as a set of countries. And there's no easy answer to compel those people.
Everybody is asking. Uh, well, can I just uh, mention something here? Doc Saab, please go ahead. I think no. one uh, issue also is that the underdeveloped uh, or the group of 77 or whatever highly indebted countries, uh, they too can get together on a single platform so that they can have a single voice as well. And that I think that would be very important. So I think multilateral, bilateral and dealing it with the issue as a union of underdeveloped countries uh, would also be very useful uh, because this uh, issue, because it's helter-skelter everybody for himself at this point in time. And unless you raise your voice, uh, you're not going to be heard. And the fact is that uh, when you are holding the debt, such a large amount of debt and you can't really pay, then it is not only a problem of the person who is going to pay, but it is also the problem of the person who is going to get that uh, payment. So I think it is in mutual interest to really sort this thing out so that it doesn't lead to a major international debt crisis where the debt markets kind of collapse. Uh, also, the fact that Pakistan's uh, debt ratings are quite vulnerable, if we don't have a multilateral kind of approach to this, unfortunately, our ratings would be wiped out and our access to I think this has to be number one on our agenda and uh, it has to cover all angles and we have to explore all, all avenues to get relief. <clears throat> Thank you. Najam, I, I just wanted to um, comment on uh, what uh, Dr. Salman Shah had said. There is a two track. One is that you approach the countries directly. That, sorry, this was the uh, Hamayun Saab. Uh, two track. One is the United States, which is very important. And the other is multilateral forums. Pe. I agree with her. The problem is immediate, but the solution is immediate available. I am going to you that there is a third track. Bhi and I asked this question from Mr. Asad Omar also when he joined us for a similar round table. Ye, ye, there is a uh, Pakistan ka jo apna manufacturing sector hai aur apni supply chain sari aap kehne effect ho rahi hai. Hum apni hi industry ke khilaaf bias kiyo rakhte hai? It started when Ayub Khan ke khilaaf ek campaign chali ki di bias khandaan aur woh bias abhi tak chal raha hai. Aaj bhi Anti-corruption campaign ka jo main target hai, jis ki factory hai, dekho, wo kahi ye zaroor chor hai, ki taraf ka. Result ye hai, ki we have become a nation of traders only. Hamne manufacturing jo hai, jo bhi manufacture karta hai, 36 centuries mm -hmm. department mein jake tang karte hai. So this third track, import substitution ka, to the free international trade ne to hume fail hi ki hai. So ye import substitution ke upar hum kyun nahi kar sakte? Why can't we encourage our own manufacturers Treat them as VVIPs, just like Chinese did to their manufacturers, and ask them to produce the stuff that we used to import from outside. Just like you have sanitizers, we allowed we became self sufficient. We didn't have to really import them. So, this is my question that on this why, why don't you have been a you know, commerce minister? Why import substitution cannot be an answer even at this time? May I answer? May I answer? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you, you are uh, dead on. If you uh, if you look at the uh, track record of all the uh, East Asian economies, starting from Japan and uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, South Korea, and later other economies, uh, the Asian economies, China, uh, their model is all, uh, they, they start with import substitution, but uh, they, at the same time, they, their incentives are such that they want to make their uh, firms competitive. 
uh, and when they reach a certain level of uh, quality and competition and price and economies of scale, then they very massively encourage uh, exports. Then they open their export sectors and invite foreign uh, direct investment. Uh, so uh, I totally agree. Uh, we, uh, while we encourage uh, the growth of our exports and try and become part of the global supply chain, which we in 72 years still haven't become part of the global supply chain. I mean, Pakistan has this mindset that, okay, uh, if I want to make a jacket uh, or if I want to make a mobile phone, I want to make every part of this mobile phone, not realizing that uh, I think uh, I may be a bit wrong with numbers, that the I iPhone is manufactured in China with parts coming from 28 countries. Uh, and that is what is called becoming part of the global supply chain. And that is what we have not become. Now, one, we try and do that. Two, yes, we very definitely uh, support our local, local industry, but in a manner that we don't end up making them totally uncompetitive and redundant and grossly, uh, uh, you know, uh, out, outpriced and outmarketed in the world, but give, give them incentives where they can become uh, 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 competitive, achieve the economies of scale, achieve uh, good standards of goods, and eventually this import substitution industry becomes an exporter. So uh, I, for one, am a firm believer of that. Thank you, Manisha. Thank you. The, there, is a small, uh, there is a comment and two questions from one of our participants. Uh, uh, unfortunately, um, he does not have uh, his audio on, so I will raise this uh, for, from his, on his behalf. The, the comment that he's making is that uh, the public sector organizations are bleeding money. The government took more than one uh, and a half year to find chief executives of OGDCL and Bank of Punjab. No privatization has taken place under the current government, which points fingers to the decision-making capability of the government itself. The question, now he has raised two questions. Number one, what are the steps taken by the government to put the house in order? And number two, will this leave a lasting impact on the reforms being proposed for debt management. Now, who's going to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> well, well uh, I, I, I can, I, I can, I can have a crack at it, and then okay, I know fair. Salman, uh, Salman Shah is uh, <laughs> looking more after Punjab, but he has also looked after the center in past years. Uh, by the way, with respect to privatization, we haven't. Uh, done any privatization, I think, since 2000, and so any significant privatization. I mean, we have gone and sold shares, uh, the government's shares of profitable PSEs. Uh, but the last uh, uh, substantive privatization was the PTCL privatization, I think, in 2006. Privatization, although it started successfully in Pakistan, we had a successful model. We privatized the entire cement sector, we privatized the banking sector. Uh, we, we privatized a lot more, but then we have had uh, huge setbacks. Uh, I mean, we could, we could not privatize the uh, uh, Pakistan steel mill, and I don't really want to go into that. Uh, I, 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 I feel ultimately the, the obstacles in the privatization of the Pakistan steel mill eventually led to the fall of the the Musharraf government, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so we are too, uh, I mean, a, a, a strong uh, government like the PMLN government of 2013 to 2018 really couldn't privatize anything, couldn't even privatize PIA, okay? Uh, so yes, we very definitely have to look at the privatization effort. Uh, there are discos which have huge problems. Uh, I think the fundamental reason of the circular debt is not the IPP, it's the disco. <clears throat> it's the discos which create the, 
the uh, the uh, circular debt, and we have to do something about the, the discourse. And sometimes we we think that look, the profit making public sector enterprises, uh, uh, I mean, should not be privatized. I mean, how do we know that the profit being made by these public sector enterprises is uh, compares uh, with the uh, the profits of that sector internationally when you compete internationally. So uh, uh, while very definitely there may be some public sector enterprises which uh, may be needed for some time, uh, but certainly the management of which can be improved, uh, I, I think that you, uh, one can't really blame this, this government, but as I said, uh, governments for the last 15 years or so, uh, which really have uh, not done uh, anything in the uh, in the area of privatization, which I, for one, I'm not speaking on behalf of the PTI here. I'm uh, just a spokesperson of the PTI. But I believe that uh, it is an essential feature uh, of what we need to do to fix uh, uh, the economy of this country, is this privatization revival of the privatization program. Thank you, Maisha. Thank you for those comments. And uh, if, I may, if I may add uh, in it. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, this uh, loss making public sector enterprises, we have to uh, uh, fix them because uh, the IMF rapid finance instrument, uh, $1.38 billion that we have received, uh, they are for COVID response and under their uh, regular a loan program, $6 billion loan program for which the uh, second review is on, uh, they will not ignore our uh, this uh, n n policy uh, fiscal slippage. Uh, so, and uh, keep on uh, investing and keep on uh, subsidizing last making public sector enterprises and then pleading our case for debt rescheduling will uh, make our uh, case for debt rescheduling very weak. So uh, I think uh, the government uh, uh, needs to talk to uh, the political opponents. One of the reasons that I can see People's Party and PMLN governments they could never uh, privatize because of uh, uh, the opposition of that time. And uh, the, similarly, now PTI is also facing uh, uh, the same uh, uh, music. Uh, PTI's opposition parties will not uh, let any privatization uh, move uh, successful. So government need to talk to opposition and uh, try to come up with some sort of agenda uh, for privatization, be it in whatever form, uh, because our lenders, they will not carry on subsidizing it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sulei, sir. Dr. Salman Shah, sir, would you like yeah, to do uh, good remarks? Yeah, I, I think this is, uh, I mean, we have to make up our minds uh, because privatization is a very populistic kind of uh, 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 policy, uh, anti-privatization anti uh, probably wins you votes or something, but it really uh, destroys your fiscal balance. It destroys uh, your resources. Uh, you could use the same money and pay off your debt, and you could use the same money to uh, fi finance your school. So we have not been able to sell a good story about privatization. And unfortunately, Pakistan is one of those countries which after the collapse of the Berlin Wall, when the rest of the world really went for big reforms and market reforms, and they were able to create very solid uh, market economy, Pakistan has not been able to do it. Pakistan, uh, for many reasons, has not focused on uh, improving the productivity of the economy. Pakistan has not focused on making Pakistan more competitive. Uh, we subsidize inefficiency. We subsidize all kinds of uh, things uh, which uh, we should not be tolerating. If you look even at our agriculture sector, look at the sugar industry, look at the flour industry, uh, highly, uh, I mean, inefficient globally. They are non-competitive. If today there were no barriers to entry, sugar industry would be wiped out. Similarly, uh, wheat production would, would just disappear because uh, we are not able to compete with this. So our cost of production and our, our, our productivity, our level of usage of uh, inputs, our usage of water, our usage of everything 
is highly inefficient. And that's why our economy, after every few years, we are, end up in the IMF because uh, the basic causes of our, uh, our, of our economy, we don't address them. And the basis, basic causes is productivity and competitiveness. Uh, it is investment in human resources. It is fixing the value chains and the supply chains and the marketing chains and the logistics infrastructure. It is fixing the financial sector. Financial sector is, is really very restrictive. It is not into uh, promoting efficiency in the, in the economy or for development for that purpose. So I think everything in Pakistan is on a kind of a status quo basis. Change is so very difficult. Now with Corona, uh, the point is that if you don't, don't change, you will perish. Post COVID-19, uh, you can't continue. You can't service your debts. Uh, you will not be able to engage in international trade because it's going to be even much more competitive. Uh, the level of technology is going to change and you have to change with it. Digitalization of the economy has to happen. So if we take up the challenge of reforms, we'll be a winner. But if we don't, I think uh, then uh, it will be a disaster. May I add something? Please, Amayi, sir. Please go ahead. Well, uh, my, my problem is that if you take the uh, sugar and flour industry out, uh, then what are you left with uh, in the rural areas of Pakistan? Uh, uh, I personally feel that uh, the government should stop interfering in these sectors and stop setting the highest price of cane, sugar cane in the world, and the highest price of wheat procurement in the world. And what that totally distorts the market. I mean, don't intervene. Don't give any protection. Don't give any tariff protection, uh, even for wheat or sugar or anything. But stop fixing prices. If you fix exorbitantly high prices, what you really are doing is that for the consumer of Pakistan. You see, you're, you're helping the farmer of Pakistan. And I'm all for the farmer of Pakistan. You're helping the farmer of Pakistan by setting up very high sugarcane prices, and then they go and produce a lot of sugarcane and very high uh, uh, wheat uh, prices. Uh, but you are penalizing the consumer of Pakistan. And when, by setting these very high prices of crops, you have a uh, uh, surplus uh, 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 atta, a surplus wheat, or surplus sugar, then you have to get that out of your system and, and export. And lo and behold, what do you find? That you have the most expensive sugar in the world and the most expensive wheat in the world because the government set up very high, high prices. And that's how the whole issue of subsidies start and has been there for years and years. It's not a recent phenomenon. So my suggestion to that is, yes, you support the agriculture sector, you support the farmer, you support the farmer by giving them direct subsidies rather than fixing the prices of crops, by helping them out through, uh, through cooperatives, by uh, uh, having them access to, uh, to, to water, by improving. Now, whose fault is it when your yields per acre for almost all the crops are the lowest in the world. It's not the private sector which is the responsible. It is the government which is responsible for that, for providing, providing, doing the research and providing the right kinds of, of seeds. So yes, I think deregulate the sectors of flour or sugar. Don't fix prices. Don't give any protection. Don't give any subsidies. Let the free market forces uh, uh, do what they can do. Excellent suggestions, uh, ye, ye comment, uh, a comment, sir, a comment, sir, a comment, a comment, sir, a comment, sir, a 
the one bag of rice for one dollar in Tokyo, whereas the Japanese government is buying the rice produced in Japan for eight dollars a kilo, a bag. So, uspe ladai shuru hogi. Japanese ne kaha ke when it comes to food, we will not compromise. हमारी कोई डिपेंडेंस फूड पे बाहर की दुनिया पे नहीं होगी सो द अमेरिकन स्टार्टेड पुटिंग रेस्ट्रिक्शंस ऑन देम इट्स कॉल्ड राइस बैशिंग उन्होंने कहा जी हम आपकी गाड़ियां नहीं लेंगे वगैरह वगैरह मैं सिर्फ पूछना चाह रहा हूं भाई साहब से कि इस फार्मूला में जो आप कह रहे हैं uh, अगर चाहे आपने एक सेफ्टी क्लॉज दी है कि डायरेक्ट सब्सिडी दे दें फार्मर्स को बट आई होप कि हमारे जो एग्रीकल्चर बास्केट है वो अफेक्ट नहीं होगी देखिए मैं आपसे गुजारिश करूं आपने मिसाल तो दी है जापान की जो कि बिल्कुल सही मिसाल है नैरानकली दूसरी तरफ आपने अमेरिका का वो राइस बैशिंग का कहा है जितनी सब्सिडीज अमेरिका देता है अपने फार्मर को या जितनी सब्सिडीज यूरोपीय यूनियन देता है या इंडिया देता है थोड़ा कभी हम स्टडी अगर कर लें सारी दुनिया बहुत मोर सो डेवलप नेशन and uh, uh, to a lesser extent uh, nations such as india or other nations they are always very sensitive look my point is my point is that the sugar that our consumer consumer main farmer ki baat nahi kar raha buys in pakistan and the atta that our consumer buys in pakistan is one of the most expensive in the world and it's only expensive kyunki hum wheat ki keemat bahut mehangi set karte hain procurement ki aur hum ganne ki keemat bahut mehangi set karte hain that's part of the the reason so i am saying that deregulate but certainly ab uh, uh, solari saab baithe hain food security ke expert hain but very definitely we will have also to take measures to uh, uh, ensure food security uh, within the country but just saying ke a whole sector which uh, or sectors which are the main stay of rural economies in pakistan should uh, be just uh, uh, they are absolutely no good i i don't think uh, one can one can say that what what should happen is stop the interference in the, some sectors and then have some measures to ensure uh, uh, food security and to help the farmers and to uh, and to improve uh, research on seeds so that uh, we can improve our recoveries and yields per acre yeah i think uh, one thing we should understand why is it that we are the most expensive in these two crops and maybe in lots of crops because our productivity is very low and i think kamayu has really uh, hit it right when he says that our investment in research our investment in extension work our investment in uh, services to the farmer they are sub optimal we are not doing the kind of research the seeds which we are using right now one can call it garbage in garbage out because the seed is so bad your output is to start off it is not going to be uh, uh, any we have seed uh, which at least five times more productive uh, in the world and we are using the far farmer uses his own home grown seed so i think the system may be because we are subsidizing at the end the final price the pressure to improve our productivity and improve our value chains is not there so i think we have to improve them and certainly the farmer must have an income you can't uh, say that when the market comes into operation the farmers will go bankrupt no we don't want the farmers to go bankrupt but their inputs have to be world class and they have to be at a price which they can afford and which can ultimately lead to uh, a market economy in the agriculture sector so there's lots of things uh, i mean our water usage for example is four to five times more than what it would be in california or in australia or somewhere else so we waste a lot of uh, these resources because we think it's free free water uh, similarly our universities 
they don't do much research. At one time, they used to be, the, when the English were here, they set up these agriculture universities for research in the agriculture sector to produce the, the varieties and the breeds which are needed. So everywhere you see these old universities, but now they are, they are not producing that kind of research. They are not doing that, uh, but they are producing substandard uh, graduates. So I think the, everything uh, in an international context, the organizations and the institutions uh, have to be of that standard as well. If you want to compete in the world, your universities, your seed suppliers and your agriculture markets and all of this has to be upgraded so that the farmer is able to get his fair share of the pie and the consumer, he gets a, a good share. So for example, if you look at uh, the wheat sector, uh, we produce so much wheat, but we don't add any value to it. Because, and I asked some, uh, one of our uh, biscuit producers, why don't you export? He says, I can't export the biscuit because it's too expensive. And why is it too expensive? Because the wheat is too expensive. So imagine that the entire value chain for wheat, uh, we can't exploit it because the first step, the wheat production is very unproductive. So I think we need to uh, work on that. And if the focus is on, on productivity, competitiveness, on value chains, and this is what I said, the coronavirus for the first time has focused our attention on supply chains and value chains. Why are the supply chains so number one, when they get disrupted, what disrupts them? It, it is the markets which disrupt them. In this case, the market has been disrupted and it, the entire supply chain is disrupted. Uh, then when you say, why aren't these supply chains going into world markets? Because they are too expensive. Everywhere there is a re regulatory uh, kind of a burden. There might be a tax burden or there may be tax avoidance somewhere. Uh, so there are so many inconsistencies in the chain that everything becomes high so transaction costs in pakistan is very very high and we need to we need to reduce those transaction costs so so that the production activity uh, can become a, 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 a very productive activity and it can make money so the farmer if we look around the farmer is is not affluent at all he's very very poor and even though he, he may be producing this bumper crops but at the end of the day, his own costs are so high that if the uh, if the support price was not there, they would they would uh, I mean they would be decimated. So I think the entire system needs is crying out for reforms, uh, and this is now the time to do these reforms, not only for wheat but for every supply chain in the country, from the textile supply chain to electronics to manufacturing everywhere you have the same issues. FBR is a very big issue. If you look at FBR and for, uh, I think at least for 30 years, every government has tried to reform it without success. And every time, uh, now the Corona has disrupted markets, but just before Corona, the traders were on strike. Why were the traders on strike? Because they were striking against the FBR uh, because they thought they, it was not a fair tax system or, or they were trying to avoid taxes, whatever. That institution has not been upgraded to the level where we can say that, yes, uh, taxes is a byproduct of the economy. Here it seems that taxes is the main function of the uh, government is to collect taxes. No, the main function of the government is to make the economy very, very competitive, very productive, very profitable. And a byproduct of all that activity is that you get a good tax uh, generation so, so that you can again use the money for the welfare of the people and make the infrastructure. So now we are finding ourselves in a very big bind because we have not reformed our supply chains and our economy and our institutions over the last so many years. So maybe this is the time to do all that reform. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shab. Last two comments of, of the webinar, one uh, by Dr. Suleri and finally uh, by Dr. Hasnan. Dr. Suleri? 
Yes, uh, thank you very much. I, uh, I've found uh, the last comments uh, from uh, Hamayo Saab and uh, Sulman Shah Saab extremely relevant and pertinent because uh, the reason we are in this uh, debt trap is that we are not able to uh, make the best use of our indigenous uh, resources. Uh, but uh, first, uh, summing up uh, uh, the need for uh, debt rescheduling, uh, I would again say that uh, uh, we are in dire need of uh, debt rescheduling. Uh, the amount of uh, uh, external debts that we have to pay over next three years, uh, those are uh, uh, quite uh, and uh, we will not be able to uh, pay them through our normal uh, resources because we'll be losing out on exports and uh, remittances and foreign direct uh, investment. So on both sides, uh, we will be uh, losing out our uh, credit rating. So I think it's better to lose your credit rating by availing debt rescheduling and uh, supporting the economy uh, through uh, financial uh, uh, easing uh, rather than uh, uh, facing uh, the uh, threat of uh, being uh, defaulting on our sovereign debts. Uh, on uh, sugarcane, uh, I endorse uh, uh, Hamayo Saab. It's not only that it's uh, uh, one of uh, the most uh, expensive uh, uh, crop for sugar, but it's also more, one of the most water-intensive crop. It takes uh, uh, much more water than uh, uh, the rice crop, uh, which is normally used to uh, uh, what as a water-intensive crop. So perhaps it is time we uh, should start moving towards sugar beets uh, uh, and uh, produce sugar from sugar beet and say goodbye to uh, sugar cane uh, for our water scarcity. Uh, on wheat, uh, uh, the problem uh, with wheat is that international, uh, for example, this year, uh, the price in Afghanistan and in Central Asia is uh, much higher uh, than our local production. So the farmers they, uh, and the flour mills, uh, they face the double-edged sword. If the international prices are uh, uh, higher, uh, we faced a uh, feel that uh, most of uh, the wheat uh, produced in Pakistan, it gets uh, smuggled uh, to Afghanistan and then to uh, Central Asia. And if it is uh, 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 international prices are lower, then of course our consumers, they have to uh, pay uh, high prices. So uh, both the sectors mm -hmm. we need to uh, reform. And, and finally, uh, in order to reform this agriculture, we need to uh, bring uh, a unity in this uh, trichotomy that we are uh, facing in agriculture, research, academia, and extension, the three departments, they don't talk to each other. So universities, they don't know what is happening in the agriculture research centers, and extension departments, they don't know what is happening in the university and in the research centers. So if we really want to uh, uh, reform and revamp our agriculture sector, we have to bring all uh, the three departments uh, uh, working together and uh, start talking to each other. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saab. Uh, I understand you have another meeting at 2, uh, 2 p.m. Uh, thank you for joining us and thank you for your comment. <clears throat> Dr. Aslam. I also have to uh, go to another meeting, so please, uh, if I can also please, beg please leave. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Salman Shah Saab. We are very grateful. Thank you, Jeet. Thank you very much. And your comments. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Hasnan. Final comment from you. Yeah, yes, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. ये बड़ी अच्छी discussion हुई इस पे subsidies पे दोनों जो है वो आपने नुक्ते नजर जो है वो सुन ली है. इसमें बड़ा simple सा जो है वो issue है. जरा आप ये देखें कि around sixty percent people are dependent on agriculture in Pakistan. जब opportunities भी जो है वो करते हैं exports में भी इसका जो है वो share है. अब हमने ये देखना है कि जो हमें इस पे सब्सिडी देनी है या नहीं देनी आप देखिए कि सब्सिडी देने के बावजूद मुल्क में जो है वो इफ्लोर क्राइसिस जो है वो रहता है दूसरी बात ये है कि सब्सिडी क्योंकि फार्म को दी जाती है लेकिन गवर्नमेंट फ्लोर मिल्स को उससे कम रेट पे जो है वो प्रोवाइड करती है ताकि कंज्यूमर को भी जो है वो कुछ रिलीफ मिल जाए अगर हम इस सब्सिडी का बाकी सब्सिडी से जो है वो आप कंपेरिजन करें तो आप रिसेंटली देख लें कि पिछले सालों तक में हमने स्टील मिल्स को कितना दिया है हमने पीआईए को कितना दिया है हमने अभी चंद ही महीने पहले जो है वो अपनी स्टॉक एक्सचेंज को जो है वो कितना उसको जो है वो स्टिमुलस दिया है और उसका उसने कितना रिस्पॉन्ड किया है तो बजाय इसके कि वो बिल्कुल सही कह रहे हैं कि जी इनफिशेंसी है हर सेक्टर में है हर जगह पर है और सब्सिडी इसको जो है वो डिस्टोशन लाती है इसमें कोई डाउट नहीं है कि रिफॉर्म्स की जरूरत है लेकिन साथ भी ये देखें कि हमारी मार्केट्स जो हैं वो इनफिशिएंट हैं। 
अगर आप फार्मर का देख लें कि उसकी इनपुट कास्ट कितनी है और उसको जो प्राइस मिलती है उनके दरमियान उसका प्रॉफिट मार्जिन कितना है तो फिर मेरे ख्याल में सिचुएशन जो है वो ज्यादा जो है वो बेहतर तरीके से जो है वो क्लियर हो सकती है अब इन गवर्नमेंट क्या कर सकती है ये फेज आउट कर सकती है सब्सिडी को इमीडिएटली ये जो है वो इसके लिए करना मेरे ख्याल में जो है वो खासा मुश्किल है इसको फेजेस में जो किया जा सकता है कि जो है वो इस साल इतनी होगी इससे अगले साल इतनी लेकिन इसके साथ साथ ये भी होगा कि आप देखें कि फर्टिलाइजर को भी सब्सिडी देते हैं फिर भी किसान का जो है वो लिविंग स्टैंडर्ड जो है वो इंक्रीज नहीं हो रहा तो इसलिए ये अब इस पे जो है वो एफर्ट की जो है वो जरूरत है कि इस पे बैठ के एक जो है वो एक जामे जो है कम्प्रीहेंसिव प्रोग्राम होना चाहिए इमीडिएटली सब्सिडी को जो है वो विड्रा करना गवर्नमेंट के लिए जो है वो इंतहा मुश्किल होगा और अगर गवर्नमेंट सारे जो है वो बुरान जो है वो फेस कर सकती है लेकिन अगर आटे का बुरान जो है वो शिदत इख्तियार कर जाए तो मेरे ख्याल में मजबूत से मजबूत गवर्नमेंट भी उसको हैंडल करना जो है वो उसके लिए मुश्किल हो सकता है थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू डॉक्टर साहब दैट ब्रिंग्स अस टू द एंड ऑफ आवर इंटरैक्टिव सेशन आई वुड नाउ रिक्वेस्ट चेयरमैन बोर्ड ऑफ गवर्नर्स इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ स्ट्रेटजिक स्टडीज एंबेसडर खालिद महमूद फॉर हिज कंक्लूडिंग रिमार्क्स सर यू हैव द फ्लोर द आवर इज लेट बिस्मिल्लाहिर रहमानिर रहीम वी हैड अ डेजलिंग गैलेक्सी ऑफ the net scholars and uh, practitioners who are all uh, eminent experts in uh, finance and uh, economy they analyze the situation arising uh, out of covid-19 pandemic uh, its uh, impact at the global level and also impact at the pakistan's national level uh talking of uh, the impact at the global level i think uh, we all know that the pandemic has uh, led to economic stagnation all over the world and the world is moving towards a recession far worse than the great depression of the 1930s uh at the national level we are faced with uh, uh contraction of exports uh compression of imports decline in uh, remittances decline in foreign direct investment and all leading to uh foreign debt uh, vulnerability so it is it is in these circumstances that uh, uh by minister uh imran khan had taken this initiative to seek uh, debt relief for the developing countries uh because developing countries are faced with this twin challenge of economy and uh, also taking care of uh, the health sector uh rightly it has been pointed out that it is not very simple to get uh, debt relief or uh, to have rescheduling or restructuring of all these uh, uh, loans uh, because as director general un stated that uh, there is no appetite for it uh, in the global institutions or at the national government levels uh, but on the other hand this is also very essential you cannot do without it and uh, uh so effort has to be made collectively and that is what the uh, uh, prime minister's initiative is aim, aiming at and already it has evoked some support from the secretary general un uh, from g20 uh but i think uh, we need to do more at uh economic diplomacy and uh, uh din this uh, um, uh, urgency of the situation and uh, to mobilize public support for this uh, initiative uh while doing that i think this is will be only provide us a breathing space 
and uh, meanwhile government has to work on uh, uh, growth models of uh, sustainable uh, development uh, only then perhaps uh, some confidence will be uh, ensured uh, so this is my uh, you know concluding remarks but uh, i would like to conclude by uh, some uh, in a lighter vein uh, that uh, while you are negotiating a loan, it is a problem of the debtor, potential debtor. Uh, how to persuade uh, a loan lender, you know, that uh, what terms of the loan should be. But once the uh, loan has been agreed to, then it is a more problem of the creditor to see how the loan, he gets back his money. So this uh, interdependence, uh, one should keep in mind uh, while dealing with this subject. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman Sir. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this brings us to uh, the conclusion of our webinar today. I would like to thank our eminent speakers and our participants for having taken time out to join us for this very important webinar on a very important subject. Thank you so much for your time, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Love this.